well, Gary, we'll just go ahead and get started as you suggested. And um, really, uh, just to let the audience know what's going on, we're waiting for two of our panelists to connect at this time. Um, okay, well, here we go. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us for the PQMD special COVID-19 Pillar Talk webinar series. Normally at this time of the year, PQMD community, we are gathered together at our global health policy forum meeting. It's a convening that's dedicated to providing space for thought leaders and global health practitioners to discover and share unique perspectives, which inspire and inform action in our shared global health work. This COVID-19 webinar series was born in that spirit. Individual sessions are, don are devoted to healthcare, uh, health workforce, supply chain, vaccines, health security, and therapeutics. Today, we'll be discussing diagnostics. I am Julie Marie Vanderberg, and I wanted to welcome you together with Elizabeth Ashburn, our Executive Director, and the entire team here at PQMD. For those of you who aren't familiar with PQMD, we're a global alliance of international NGOs and leading healthcare companies committed to advancing the role of product donations worldwide. We have 41 members, and we were founded in 1999. Our work is guided by five pillars, humanitarian assistance, health system strengthening, disaster response and preparedness, guidelines, and knowledge management. By virtue of our trusted network, our members leverage their partnerships, expertise, and resources for impact, all while adhering to the highest standards of excellence in donation um, practices. Today, the work of our members is central to the international response to coronavirus. Our members are focused on critical supplies, supporting healthcare workers, and donating cash where it's most needed. And of course, in developing technologies and safe solutions, including diagnostics. Before we even start with the webinar, I really wanted to underscore our gratitude to one of our members. Midmark is hosting this webinar today on their WebEx platform, and we are so grateful for your involvement and support. Uh, quickly, I just wanted to review a few housekeeping rules. So go ahead and warm up your fingers. Everybody, please type into the chat box and let us know who's out there, who's attending, and the organization that you work with, too. Um, and because it's such a large audience, all of the participants are muted and your videos are disabled. But we do invite you to use the chat box for questions and comments. This uh, session is being recorded, um, and we'll share it with you on PQMD's online community of practice. I'll go ahead and float that link out into the chat box as well. Now, I have the pleasure of turning it over to Gary Cohen, who is moderating this session on behalf of the PQMD membership. Gary Cohen is the Executive Vice President of Global Health at Becton Dickinson and the President of the BD Foundation. His work at BD is focused on specific health goals and is addressing unmet needs in infectious and non-communicable diseases, strengthening clinical and laboratory health practices, supporting healthcare workers and improving safety, among, among other areas. Gary is committing to advancing health and human rights as a board member for UNICEF USA and Global Partnership um, to End Violence Against Children, GBC Health, and Together for Girls. Together for Girls is an international organization that he founded to stop violence against children through data-informed action and advocacy. Gary's extensive work in cross-sector collaboration and his current role as the chair of the CDC Corporate Roundtable Press make him an ideal moderator for us today. And I'd like to add, Gary, it's been an honor to work with you on this. So thank you very much, Gary. Well, thank you, Julie Marie, and uh, welcome everyone. I think it just goes to show when you make a bunch of stuff up and put it on your resume, it does really sound impressive. And um, I may add some more things. I've never done to that as well, because I found out it comes across well. I know we're still waiting, I think, for two of our panelists, but we are going to go ahead. Uh, if we're unable to connect them via WebEx, we might want to see if they can fly in. I, I think there are still some flights uh, that are that are working even under the COVID-19 situation. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all the panelists now, but before I do so, I'm sure you've heard the uh, ancient proverb, uh, may you live in interesting times. Well, we're certainly living in interesting, interesting times, and when that proverb first started, it wasn't meant to be a good thing. It, it's it's a tough thing. Um, and we are living through very difficult times. I'm assuming most or maybe the vast majority of you who are joining are doing so from home. Uh, we're now around many of us two months of being home. I think we're kind of in that middle lull period where the uh, novelty of working from home has worn off. I think we're all kind of anxious to get back to life. 
as it will be as opposed to how it was, because I think we all realize too, it's not going to be the same as it was before. Many things have changed. And one of the things that I find remarkable that I never would have expected is that every day when I look at the news, and I tend to read it more so than watch it, there are many, many articles about diagnostic testing. And those are being read in the general media by you know, the average person on the street who prior to COVID-19 probably was only thinking about diagnostics when they had to have their blood drawn and then they uh, cursed BD for making the needle that got stuck in their vein. But nowadays, diagnostic testing is sort of in the front and center of our attention. Hence, it, it's a perfect topic for us to be discussing today. And I, all I can tell you is I hope that the other panelists are able to connect. It would be a disappointment if they can't, because you could not assemble a better panel of experts on diagnostic testing, in this case related to COVID-19, representing all areas of the world. So if they, they connect, I think those of you who decide to join today will consider yourself fortunate to have heard from these panelists. I'm going to introduce them now, all four of them, and then we're going to go into questions. And just uh, for full transparency, I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to work. There are two questions for each panelist. We're going to go one through four and then one through four again. Hopefully there'll be time at the end, and I think there will be, to take questions from you as attendees. And uh, to do so, you can ask your question, I, I believe, using the uh, the chat function. And we'll take a look at the questions. We may not get to all of them if there are many, but we'll get to as many as we can, and we'll have the panelists at the end, time permitting, make some closing remarks. So now to introduce the panelists, I'm going to start with Dr. Dr. John Kangasan, who is uh, the director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He was first appointed to this role as the first director. It's a relatively new organization, Africa CDC, in November 2016, and to establish it as an Africa-owned public health institution supporting countries in Africa to improve surveillance, preparedness, response, and prevention of disease threats. He's a leading virologist with 30 years of work experience in public health. Prior to his appointment as the first leader of the Africa CDC, he was associate director of laboratory science and chief of the international laboratory branch at the division of the Global HIV and AIDS Center for Global Health at the U.S. Centers for Disease control and prevention. Now, I do a lot of work with the CDC, and I know they have very long titles, and that was one of them. Earlier in his career, Dr. Nakengasan worked for the WHO as Chief of Virology at the Collaborating Center on HIV Diagnostics. He also led the establishment of the African Society for Laboratory Medicine and served as its chair. I can say without reservation, you will not find anyone in the world who knows more than John about laboratory systems and testing in Africa. Our next panelist, Stan Bergman, chairman and board chairman of the board and chief executive officer of Henry Schein. Stan has been in this position since 1989. He's been CEO of Henry Schein since 1989. That's 31 years. I don't think you can find any CEO of a publicly traded company who has been in their role that long. And it speaks for itself. Stan has been enormously successful as a CEO of Henry Schein, and it, therefore it's no wonder that Henry Schein has been named as a Fortune Most Admired Company for 19 consecutive years. He serves on numerous boards as an advisor or board director. Uh, some of the institutions include NYU University College of Dentistry, University of Pennsylvania School of Dental, Dental Medicine, Columbia University Medical Center, University of the People, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and others. And he serves on the World Economic Forum's Board of Governors, the Business Council for International Understanding and the Japan Society and the Metropolitan Opera. I know Stan for many years. Personally, he is among the most active leaders in the world, not just in business, but in areas of social impact as well. Our third panelist is Suman Koo, Deputy Director of Innovative Technology Solutions in the global, for Global Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in her present role, Suman leads a variety of focus areas related to topics we're going to cover in this webinar including the development of high quality and accessible diagnostics for low and middle income countries. And as part of the foundation's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, she serves as the lead for a foundation-led diagnostic leaders roundtable, which brings together industry leaders to address roadblocks to testing access and catalyzes the development of diagnostic tests for developed and emerging countries, developing and emerging countries. Uh, Suman holds a PhD in genetics from Harvard University, and a BA from the University of Cambridge. Now, I didn't put in the uh, academic credentials of the other panelists, but I read that and I thought, can you imagine how smart you have to be to get a PhD in genetics from Harvard? 
my mother would say Suman is one smart cookie. And for purposes of this webinar, we're going to spell that K-O-O-K-I-E. Uh, and then we have Dave Hickey, who's the worldwide president of life science, worldwide president of integrated diagnostic solutions in BD Life Sciences. He's a personal colleague at BD. He's also among the most experienced diagnostic industry leaders in the world with over 25 years of experience in in vitro diagnostics. And at Becton Dickinson, Dave's responsible for executing the strategic and financial performance of the worldwide BD integrated diagnostic solution business segment, which includes specimen management, microbiology, molecular diagnostics, women's health and cancer, and point of care chronic portfolios. Dave also serves on numerous boards, including AvMed DX or Diagnostics, the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the University of Maryland Health Sciences Research Park. He's also a heck of a nice guy. I'm gonna say that as well, Dave, if you don't mind. So I'm hoping now, well, actually we're gonna start, Dave, with you. And I know that you're already on the line. I am hoping that we've been able to connect our other panelists, but as I mentioned before, Diagnostics is in the news every day, and you have world leaders talking about diagnostics, situations you just wouldn't ever have expected. And just to ground us, to level set us, could you briefly describe what are the different types of diagnostic testing and tests that are relevant for COVID-19? Why are each of them needed? And what challenges exist for making these tests available to much broader populations, both here in the US and worldwide? Because we're hearing about those challenges just about every day as well. Dave, over to you. So, Gary, thank you very much, and thank you to the uh, PQMD team for, for having us join. And I can say, based on what I saw of the cameras, that uh, uh, Stan and John have, have joined. And, you know, I know this is very much a roundtable dialogue, but but I also thought I'd just put one slide up as I talk to, to Gary's question um, around trying to just provide some colour. Um, and, at, at, you know, at the highest level, on diagnostics specifically, um, the way to think about it is, and, and as we see the diagnostic kits emerging, it's really diagnostic insight for those that have the disease. So to diagnose and detect those that potentially have COVID-19 or coronavirus and those that have had it. So um, I'll just talk very quickly to the content on this slide because there's a, uh, there's a wide array of diagnostic tests. But at the end of the day, and, and as you watch all the sort of press and the news conferences around the world, it all actually starts with the specimen collection. Um, and what is the sample type, you know, collected by a swab or whole blood that's got to feed into the diagnostic platform itself. And uh, I'll talk about access and scale as part of my concluding comments to, to this first question. So for us, um, and a lot of industry manufacturers around the world, the very first focus when they started globally was around just making sure there was enough capacity of the diagnostic tests, uh, the, the, the swabs and the collection. And then there are really um, three types of diagnostic test. So I'm actually going to start to the right because one of the first tests that started to emerge, and this was really sort of working with, um, and you saw the development with the CDC in China, came into Europe, and obviously now the rest of the world and, and the US is the molecular diagnostic test, uh, usually based on PCR or isothermal techniques, that's a direct measure of whether somebody has actually got the virus themselves. So when you hear about molecular tests or PCR based tests, uh, that really is the sort of platform in a central lab that um, would provide a diagnostic test within about a two to three hour turnaround time. Um, now, of course, that is critically important but one of the things when we look at this is how do we drive access and scale and increase the volume of testing? So several companies, BD included, but several companies are working on uh, addressing a problem. What if we could only sort of scale this up and provide decentralized and point of care testing still for the virus? So you're now starting to see a lot of reference around these point of care antigen tests um, that actually you know, we'll go out into the decentralized community, clear based laboratories, lab based licensed labs to actually look at faster rapid tests. So this would still use a swab, but now you're looking at results that could potentially be available in 15 minutes or less. Um, so a tremendous opportunity to speed up the time to diagnosis and provide far, far more testing platforms. 
So those two technologies are really focused on the direct di diagnostic for the virus itself. But of course now, and there's a lot of reference to this in, in, in the press and the media around these serology tests. And this is part of the equation around who is at it. You know, there's enough evidence out there and a lot of dialogue around getting back to work strategies, getting people back into the healthcare system when all these elective procedures stopped. And there's a huge hypothesis that says if you've had the virus or you've been exposed to the virus, you're highly likely to develop antibodies and to some degree, uh, you know, immunity towards uh, further infection. So what you're now starting to see is a wider range of, of, of these antibody tests that look at people's immune response and adding antibody response to actually uh, being able to detect. And this is very important because a lot of the tests themselves or patients uh, are also asymptomatic. There's a lot of literature to say that people who've actually had COVID-19 have not presented with any symptoms, but they may well have de developed antibodies. So we see both the diagnostic antigen test and the serology test as working complementary to help just basically triage the global population around who has the test, who has the virus or who has had it. And if they've got the antibodies, you know, could they start to be part, part of get to get back to work strategy? So Gary, maybe with that, I'll, I'll stop. Well, thank you, Dave. I think you set the stage for us, and I'm so pleased that uh, all our panelists have been able to connect. And Stan, I'm assuming you're on the line now. It's a pleasure to have you join uh, this webinar, and I want to thank you for participating. And let me shoot the next question at you. So Henry Schein, the company that you've been leading for 31 years, and if you weren't on the line at that time, I shared with everyone how amazing it is to be CEO of a publicly traded company for 31 years. It's the world's largest provider of healthcare products and related solutions to office-based dental and medical practitioners serving healthcare facilities and providers outside of the acute care or acute care hospital setting. Now, I know, because uh, we've known each other for some time, and you actually contacted me on March 13th this year, that you've been a key advocate nationally for policies that will facilitate testing in non-hospital settings outside of central labs outside of labs that exist in hospitals to enable much broader access to testing. So why do you feel this is so important and what did you need to do to raise greater awareness of this need? Gary, it's good to be here with you on this, uh, in this webinar. Dave as well. Firstly, Gary, thank you for what you do to advance public health, of course, in the developed world but specifically in the developing world where people just do not have resources and right now are about to go into a significant period when this coronavirus is going to start spreading in the developing world. And I know you champion the underserved. So uh, as you correctly point out, we are the largest provider of products and related services to office-based healthcare practitioners. And in that context, have been providing laboratory testing in the office setting to healthcare practitioners, primarily physicians, but also dentists. And as this crisis started to evolve, we said to ourselves, well, what are we going to do to help our physician customers who are close to the public in the communities provide for testing capabilities? And so we scoured the world and we were able to identify some point of care, rapid test that did not require any machinery. And so once we discovered these products, our first stop was to BD, to say, BD, you have the knowledge, what can you do to bring these products out into the market as quickly as possible to service our customers? And we think that, and I'm glad Dave outlined these three kinds of tests, so articulately, because we think that there's a big misunderstanding by the media and the public. These antibody tests and even the PCR test or the antigen test are not simply tests like the pregnancy test. It's not that you're pregnant or you're not. It's not that you have the virus or you don't have the virus. It's much more complex. These tests have to be worked 
in a combination. The, at the end of the day, the physician has to examine the patient and have a discussion with the patient. And from there, a diagnosis can be made. And we felt it was really important to bring this understanding into the physician community. And we're working on that. The biggest challenge, Gary, is that there is no testing capability that is a simple one-line answer. Similarly, by the way, to the whole way in which the flu world works. Sometimes the flu vaccine is effective and sometimes it's not, but no one would advocate for, or very few people would advocate for not having flu inoculation. Same with flu testing. Very often it's right, very often it's not perfect. One has to understand that we're at the early stages of this disease, of this virus being spread, and we need to do all, understand all the tools and in particular, I have to understand how all these tools come together. And Henry Schein, as providing services to the physician, the alternate set care setting, the community centers, we want to be there to help, help our customers, help the public, those that serve the public, understand how to use all of these tests. And by the way, uh, BD has done a remarkable job educating the public already, or at least helping us educate our customers on how these various tests work together. Thank you, Stan. Excellent, excellent description of, of the need and the challenges we face and the fact that this is still at an early stage. And uh, as this ramps up, it's important that people have the right expectations about why the testing is so important and what the accuracy levels are and the, the, this, the role that these tests will play in society, which is gonna be a very vital role. So, John, I'm going to turn to you now. And uh, before I ask the question, I just want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, those of you who are attending this webinar, John is joining us from Ethiopia, as I mentioned, when he's the director of the Africa CDC. And we know how much we are indebted to people who are operating on the front lines of this pandemic. Well, John is sort of one of the super, super people. He's Superman on the front lines because he's leading the most important public health agency in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, John, I'm going to ask the question now. We've got a little bit of background noise, but it's probably because you've unmuted. So, Africa CDC, CDC reports in into the African Union, and you're in the center of determining what the public health response to COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa will be. You've also had years of experience working at the U.S. CDC. What are the unique challenges that you're experiencing responding to COVID-19 in Africa, and what, in what ways will diagnostic testing conditions and needs be different from what we experience in the U.S., Europe, and Asia? In what ways might be the same? And I know that just after, I think this has been a major challenge. So over to you, John. Thank you, Gary, and um, good afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues. And Gary, thank you again for uh, including me as part of this very important dialogue. And for those who are on the webinar and on the panel, I think yeah, I just wanted to state how much, um, for the many years I've known Gary, and I knew, I knew him before I met him. I knew him from his paper he published in uh, AIDS. I remember vividly when reading that paper and wondering uh, who wrote such a paper and in AIDS articulating issues related to diagnostics. So, and subsequently, the partnership we developed at PEPFA, uh, the public-private partnership with Renoka, actually uh, made me to understand and, and get to know Larry's passion in, in diagnostics, especially in developed world, in developing countries, as I beg your pardon. So I think for Africa, I mean, it's clear. Let me just start from a standpoint that um, defines what diagnostics uh, must do uh, for, for our continent. Diagnostic clearly is the backbone of any infectious disease control. Without diagnostics, public health response collapse. And I think that is very, very clear. But I'll just state this, that uh, for the many years I've uh, practiced diagnostics, uh, is, is, is mainly in HIV, there are four things that we are looking for diagnostics for to be effective to support a public health response. One is the first, first question is always, is it available? I mean, which means is it available with quality? The second thing is, is it affordable? I mean, it can be available, but if it's too expensive for resource poor settings, then it, it doesn't make sense. Then uh, uh, thirdly, is it accessible? And lastly, is it scalable? I think I say this because of the question Gary asked about how different 
is diagnostics in, in, in the US or in developed world compared to uh, the developing countries. Uh, we, as the continent, have uh, faced the challenge. Uh, we had war, like you had war with COVID-19. Uh, uh, and first of all, let me start with the good things. The good things is that the leadership, the political leadership of the continent is fully rallied and is highly uh, supportive of, of all the efforts that the Africa CDC is um, uh, 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 conducting and advising countries. Uh, I actually report, I've reported four times over the last uh, uh, couple of five weeks to the head of states, the Bureau of Head of States, uh, made up of about nine to, uh, to ten uh, uh, head of states and head of governments. I say this to highlight that without that kind of political support and that political commitment, uh, you probably have an upheat as, as a public health agency for, for the continent. So the challenge we have now is how do we access the diagnostics? As a continent, we've tested uh, way under 850,000 uh, people, or rather conducted less than 850,000 tests for a continent of 1.3 billion people. And if you divide that by uh, the, the 1.3 billion people, it gives you less than about 700 uh, tests per million. And we, because of that, I mean, it's fair to say that we are uh, behind the pandemic, not ahead of the pandemic. Uh, the, 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 the disease we are dealing with, it's, it's amazing that we've only known this virus for the last four to five months, but uh, the intensity of which we engage it makes it look like we've lived with, with it for five months, for five years or, or, or four years. Uh, we've known more about this virus than uh, it, uh, that many uh, 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 circumstances would allow. I'm just knowing that from January to now, we have able to de uh, design diagnostic tests and we are out there fighting the virus very, very hard. But Africa is challenged because all the diagnostics are produced outside of the continent. Even when they are available on the continent, the platforms that carry them are very restricted such that you cannot decentralize your, your tests. Again, that feeds into the, the four centralities of diagnostics that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, availability, affordability, accessibility, and scalability. So I think as a continent, we are still challenged with that, I'm trying to unlock the supply chain a system to enable us scale up testing as much as, as, as we, we, we would like to, in order to fight uh, and wage um, a, a strong fight using the very basic tools we have, which have existed for many years. We believe that we have a chance to still fight this virus with the 49,000 cases on the continent, with about 2,000 deaths. We are still early in the pandemic and with the appropriate diagnostics that are accessible and scalable, we, we actually have a, a very good chance of, of fighting back. So we've launched an initiative called Partnership to Accelerate COVID Testing, abbreviated PAT, which is underpinned by a, a, a track, test, trace, and treat. I think we believe that we should simplify our approaches and make it and go back to the basics of public health for infectious disease, which talks about the standard shoe leather epidemiology. So accompany that, which is probably something that is not common in, in most uh, settings in the, the developed economies, is the ability for us to try to deploy one million uh, foot soldiers to accompany this uh, very central concept of the shoe leather epidemiology. So in addition to advancing testing, we believe that testing must be accompanied by a very aggressive approach to detect the, the cases, isolate them, and, and trace their contacts. So I think in a nutshell, that is where we are with the continent, with their challenges, and also the opportunities. John, thank you. That was crystal clear. It came through perfectly, both uh, both the quality of the transmission, but even more so the quality of your intervention. And I, I just want to say to everyone who's part of this webinar, if you have any questions about whether the highest levels of knowledge and capability are leading this work in Sub-Saharan Africa, you just saw for yourself uh, the example of the fact that it is and if you're thinking that you want to support the scale up of testing in sub-saharan africa uh, you can directly support it through africa cdc and i would encourage it and i think john also your description is a perfect lead in to the question now to suman uh, the gates foundation has done so much and has such a remarkable track record of funding and supporting innovation and health interventions in developing countries 
and I know you're working directly on the types of issues that John has laid out in front of us. So what are your priority areas in the Gates Foundation that you're working on uh, that can support lower resource countries in their response to COVID-19? Thank you, Gary. As you alluded to, the foundation's primary commitment in terms of global health and delivery is serving the LMICs, uh, low and middle income countries, and addressing uh, diseases endemic to those regions. Given the global nature of the many of the diseases, and especially for COVID-19, the foundation has been mobilized to a very large extent in the response, and in specifically around diagnostic, that has been a lot of work, both on the accessibility, but also on the um, accelerating product development um, and also the uh, scalability of many of these tests. Um, to John's point earlier, um, the foundation is aligned in terms of um, investing in high quality, affordable, accessible, and scalable solutions in all fronts um, across the tests. Um, the development, we firmly believe that the uh, development of the antigen based connected rapid diagnostic tests would be a very critical component supporting the COVID testing in the specific um, settings of low and middle income countries. Um, to uh, Dave's point and also um, uh, Stan's point earlier, the various tests, all of them, the serology test, the molecular test, and many of other tests that we see in the market for diagnostics have a time and place. But the area that we are really focusing on in the coming times is the development, accelerating the development of um, the antigen-based rapid diagnostic tests. And you might ask, why is that the case? Um, just given the large scale tests that we need in the coming months, we believe that that's an area where we would be able to um, make a difference in making sure that the, uh, there will be sufficient tests in the market that would allow us to detect the cases, do the isolation, and be able to contain in a, in a way that actually is meaningful to contain the pandemic. Um, one of the initiatives that the foundation has been um, alluded earlier, the gathering of diagnostic leaders in the global health roundtable, and that has been uh, highly focused on uh, resolving some of the key challenges that we see in the existing tests, but also focusing on the acceleration of the development of such a test of the antigen based rapid diagnostic tests. Um, we believe that integrating a simple mobile based digital connectivity some of these tests would also be the next phase that will allow us to actually have um, a place that will give us uh, uh, um, Gary to actually help us with the next question. So, we're, you know, we've uh... We've gone through the first round of questions and it's 104 uh, New York time. So we have 26 minutes. I'm going to go through the second round of questions now and ask each of the panelists to spend about two to three minutes maximum. And that will then allow time for questions from the other participants. So Dave, I'm going to circle back to you first. And um, personally, as I mentioned, I've never seen diagnostics in the news the way it is now in the global and national spotlight. My question to you is a simple one. Do you think there will be a permanent change in the role of diagnostics in society as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, thank you, Gary. And it's a great question. And honestly, I think there has to be. Um, you know, for somebody like myself that, that started his career actually as a clinical biochemist in a, in a UK NHS lab, I think there's a, for many, many years, there's been a an underappreciation of the role of diagnostics. But when you work in the diagnostic field, actually, even before the, the, the pandemic, there's really nice literature out there and studies that would say, you know, approximately 60 to, seven, 60 to 70% of clinical decisions that a physician will make is in, are informed by a diagnostic result. Um, and that was that's just in the normal world, right? So I think you know if you now look at the the role that diagnostics has played in in the management and treatment of this pandemic, because it informs every starting point um, in terms of how you triage the patient, how you sort of medication management the patient, et cetera, et cetera. It all starts with that uh, symptomatic diagnostic. Um, so I, I think this has really helped for, for a lot of the wrong reasons in a way, put, put diagnostics at the forefront. But what I think it's also done is, you know, once we're behind this a little bit, 
I think for me, there's an opportunity for ourselves as an industry, but also the, the, the agencies like the FDA and the competent authorities to take a step back and look at what we've just enabled in terms of the speed of response. So I can tell you, you know, in, in my own world and, and, and partnering with great companies like Stan and, and Shine is we've managed to get things done in, in two to three months in terms of rapidly prototyping assays that you would normally take 18 to 24 months done. We've done supply chain and business development agreements in 10 to 11 days when it would normally take six months. And I think it's because everybody rallies around that unifying cause. You get the right team around the table and you just get things done. Equally from the agency's perspective, and I'll just talk about the FDA as one example, is you know they've also been a hugely en um, enabling vehicle in this. So again, most of us, when we commercialize and develop diagnostic tests, we work on 510Ks and PMAs. The agency created this process for emergency use authorization, uh, which has allowed us to rapidly prototype an assay, get comfortable with its clinical validation, and then still follow up with the critical paperwork. But everybody is still developing, launching, and the physicians are using very clinically useful tests. So I think it will propel the value of diagnostics. I think it will raise the appreciation of diagnostics. And then I think industry and agency will look back on this and say, how did we just do what we just did? And how does that become more of the normal business model? Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. You know, it's uh, there's an expression making lemonade out of lemons. You know, we were handed a big lemon with COVID-19, but there are things that can be improved for the long term as a result of the agility and the speed that we've all been exhibiting. And we've been doing this in, as you mentioned, in collaborative work and partnership with government agencies and working across sectors, which kind of leads me to the next question for you, Stan. You know, I know you well enough to know that you're not only leading a, a very large very successful publicly traded company, you serve a greater leadership role in society, working with many organizations, including UN agencies and the World Economic Forum, and you're personally very devoted to improving society broadly and globally. And that, that means leadership. And at a time like this, leadership becomes very important, regardless of whether it's public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, foundations, and I'm just interested to hear some of your perspective. I think everyone else will be as well on what are your reflections on leadership at a time like this, particularly with respect to diagnostics, but even more broadly uh, in view of the COVID-19 pandemic, what should we expect of leaders? Well, Gary, um, firstly, thank you for what you're doing again. And uh, Dave, I think you articulated a thought very quickly of how businesses can come together and uh, that are normally not aligned in a specific aspect of bringing a product to market, for example, and working together to quickly bring a product to market. But uh, Gary, I, I think this is a time for PPP, public-private partnerships. In fact, I'm not sure whether there's been any major innovation that's been brought to market in healthcare that hasn't been in some form or another public-private partnership. Yes, there is terrific work being done, I think, on the vaccine side. And I think there's also good activity going on on the treatment side. But what we need to lead on is on the prevention side and on the testing side. I think we need to create the right public-private partnerships to advance both prevention and testing. On the prevention side, we started in uh, in a modest way with creating the pandemic supply chain network. This is a group of companies, and of course, a BDS part of that group, where we said to each other about five years ago that what we wanted to do was prepare a list of countries and products that are needed for a pandemic. Uh, we worked with the World Health Organization, the World Food, World Food Program, the World Bank, the UN, and uh, about 40 other companies that meet regularly to discuss this particular topic, the providing of PPE in case of a pandemic. Sadly, our work was not, has not yet been completed, but had the work not begun, 
I think we would be even in a worse position with PPE. We need that kind of collaboration for PPE and for testing. And we need to make sure that we figure out how to bring these tests to the market. And in particular, I would say, for the less developed part of the world, we need to have public-private partnerships for these quick tests, these rapid tests, because in many parts of the world, there is no transportation to really deal with the larger machinery. What we need to do is bring the tests to the community rather than bring the community to the testing machine. And this lends itself for a public-private partnership. Outstanding work has been done, and the Gates Foundation included, for example, on vaccines. And much has happened and great progress. And also great progress is occurring now on the treatment. We need to do exactly that for PPE, much more of that, but for testing with devices, quick snap testing in the community. Perfect private-public partnership and essential and required. Absolutely. Thank you, Stan. I think you've really laid that out very, very clearly. And I agree with your point that major health interventions throughout the world, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, almost always are an outcome of cross-sector collaboration through public-private partnership. And, and John, who's on the line, has a lot of experience in that as well. John, I'm going to turn to you in a moment for the last question. Before I do so, Suman, I'm turning back to you. And I, one of the things I found remarkable about what the Gates Foundation has been doing since the start of COVID-19 is it's extended its work beyond the key constituencies it typically serves, which are typically lower income countries and, and more vulnerable populations. And it's actually been engaged with the US government and others to help establish standards that can increase the supply of vitally needed commodities such as nasal swabs. And that would be helpful both to industrialized and developing countries. So what would you say those efforts aim to achieve uh, and how can these enable us, help us secure better access to quality diagnostics globally? Um, thank you, Gary. So given the nature of the COVID disease, and frankly, many of the diseases today, and the disproportionate burden they actually have on the poor, um, the foundation has invested in health interventions um, kind of domestically in the U.S. as well, that would actually scale with clear synergies between um, what is being done here and also the LMICs. So one example that we, uh, I can talk to um, over the last two years is what we have done with the Seattle flu study which is really the foundation that, you, um, that you're that you seeing in the news of what we're actually getting in the COVID study. Uh, the study was actually originated to understand how influenza and other respiratory diseases spread and cause the outbreaks in certain communities. With the advent of the uh, COVID-19, we were able to build on this work and pivot it to actually demonstrate certain key points. So for example, the point of care sample collection of self-swap that you just mentioned, um, showing the data that the cell swap that you see for the nasal and using alternative substitute uh, materials was equivalent, uh, is equivalent to the nasal pharyngeal swaps that is currently being used. And this has since been approved by the FDA. Um, incoming live data that says that um, the data also shows that we can use alternative media such as saline um, to collect the uh, swaps. We have also kind of data to show that it could be potentially used in the self um, in the home test settings um, that again will be applicable to beyond just the US and it will be applicable in the low resource settings as well in, in other countries globally. Um, the, these are just points of um, examples that some of the work that we are doing in the US can actually be scaled and fundamentally change the way we test and respond to these diseases globally as well. Thank you, Suman. And John, we're going to uh, have the final question for you, and then we should have about 10 minutes left for questions from the audience and maybe a few a few closing remarks. But I, I, this is really a, a foundational way, I think, to close our discussion. You know as well as anyone that public health has been underinvested in for since the beginning of time, perhaps. And, and, and public health agencies like CDC and Africa CDC are always calling attention to the need to invest more in public health, and yet it only seems to get attention during the time of a crisis when everybody's scrambling and we don't have the preventative measures in place that we really needed to have. Well, now we're in a situation that is probably going to have a longer tail, longer lasting impact than any other recent 
epidemic or pandemic such as Ebola or, or Zika or H1N1 flu. This is going to be with us for a while. Do you think this might finally trigger the understanding and need for the foundational investments and collaboration that will be required to strengthen public health systems across Africa? Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm hoping so, but um, and also uh, I'm hopeful, but I'm also skeptical uh, because the, 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 if you look at the history of of the world uh, and how we reacted to pandemics from 19 from 1720 with the the, the, the plague outbreak in 1820 with the cholera outbreak in 1918 with the influenza. Uh, the Spanish flu, and now 100 years later with another, you see that we've always reacted to, to events. And and just four or five years ago in West Africa, with the Ebola outbreak, we thought, well, uh, the world was uh, awakening and uh, something significant will happen. But suddenly, uh, a lot of nice reports were, were, were written. I started reviewing some that were published in the Lancet or New England Journal. And I was uh, joking to myself. I said, well, maybe I should take one of those reports and change Ebola and replace it with uh, COVID-19. And you get a report already that will speak to what we need to do uh, after COVID-19 is over. But you, as you rightly stated, uh, uh, Gary, there's, uh, we are in for a long journey. I think let nobody be fooled that this, this is not just another Ebola outbreak where after two years or one year it will be over. We'll be living with this virus for, for a while. So. Diagnostics, therefore, will continue to play a central role uh, in our battle against uh, COVID-19. Of course, if life has to return to normal, three things must happen. We must have diagnostics that meet the criteria that are indicated, that are sensible, scalable. We must have vaccines and we must have treatment. Otherwise, we will not, life will not return to normal uh, with, with COVID infection. I just want to, at this point, really take uh, a moment to acknowledge the extremely important work that the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did in supporting Africa CDC very early on, where at that time we had no cases on the continent. They were smart enough to uh, work with us and equip us to uh, uh, provide diagnostics across the continent. We moved from a situation where in January, if the continent had been attacked with this virus. No country had the ability to diagnose uh, uh, for the virus. To a situation where we scale up diagnostics by pulling people into Senegal and pulling people to South Africa almost back to back within three weeks and scaling the diagnostics to 43 countries. I think that was thanks to the support that uh, 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 the, the foundation, the Gates Foundation, uh, uh, provided us. So I use that. I, I, say, I use that to say that in order to transform the landscape of diagnostics on the continent, we need. I mean, as one of the panelists uh, indicated, uh, a strong public-private partnership that will include maybe I'll add the fourth P there, which is philanthropy, where we have the public-private uh, uh, philanthropic partnership to uh, change the landscape and uh, 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 an organization like the Gates Foundation stands uh, uh, in a very in a poor position. And, and credit must be given to the remarkable work that they, they did in, in really saving the continent. And the second layer of partnership, they are champions. And I think uh, the BD is as positioned itself over the last, what, two decades as a champion in advancing diagnostics for uh, diseases like HIV and, and TB through this public, private, uh, and, and uh, I'm adding the fourth P philanthropic partnerships there. I think. Um, let me just share a story with you. What, when I was in Atlanta running the, the PEPFAR lab program, and uh, we started the discussions with a, a BD on how to establish uh, the public-private partnership. Uh, one morning around six o'clock, I remember vividly, I received a call from Renuka. And um, I don't know if she's on this uh, panel on, on this uh, webinar or not. And I was, I, I look at the phone, it was Renuka, I was hesitant to take the phone. I said, why is she calling me at six o'clock in the morning? And she was so excited when I picked the phone. She said, John, I have an idea for the PPP we should do uh, with uh, uh, PEPFA. We should call it Lab for Life. And what do you think? I said, um, yes, I think it's a good idea. And we made remarkable progress with Lab for Life uh, by scaling up our credit uh, supporting labs in Kenya, uh, uh, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and other Mozambique to, to actually bring them to accreditation and to bring affordable diagnostics. That's the kind of championship 
that we need uh, in this, at this moment that we should at, on this call at the end of this call for action where we should call for a ppp for lab for life for covid to stop covid across the world because we are going to live in with this covid for 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 a long time so i think uh, we should extend that concept for lab for life to a lab for life to stop covid 19. thank you Thank you, John, and I uh, appreciate uh, the compliments to Renuka that he's referring to Renuka Gade, the vice president of uh, of global health at BD. And those of us who know her know she is working 24 hours a day, so it's not surprising to us that she called you at six in the morning. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that you were up to to answer the call as well. And, and the idea of extending labs uh, labs for life to uh, to COVID-19 makes absolute sense. Now. We have received a number of questions. I'm going to read off two or three of them and then invite the panelists to answer as they feel is best within their areas of responsibility. And we have nine minutes left. I'd like to reserve the last minute, if you will, for each panelist just to give us one or two sentences. What is the most important thing that they want to see happen with respect to COVID-19 and diagnostics? And that will reserve for, for the close of the webinar. But let me read off a few of these questions. So. Um, one of them is, we see how highly contagious COVID is, and as a result, we need to the public to understand the current capabilities of testing that's available. Is there any concern that current testing available could create a false sense of security as we look to reopen? And those of you who are not in the United States, I, I'll tell you that we have a very um, nonlinear approach to reopening the country here. I'll just leave it at that. It, it, it's anything but, but uniform. Uh, so is there concern about false and security? Uh, let me ask a, a couple of these other questions, and then again, panelists, feel free to, to, to jump in. And there's more questions coming in now. There's one specific for Africa CDC. Is Africa CDC working through national governments, through CDC country offices, through local academics or NGOs, or all of the above? And uh, how how is that being, being used to support diagnostics at a local level? Um, what support do the panelists anticipate being needed for fragile health systems? Um, when do you think there'll be a COVID-19 vaccine? What, what's a realistic timeline? There's certainly a lot of different information in the news and a vaccine that's not just available for the US, but globally, including for developing countries. And then I'm gonna, I, I know I'm, I've overlooked a few questions. I'll come back to them if there's time, but there's been a lot in the news about specificity and sensitivity of serology tests and point of care tests. Uh, what are those numbers for various tests that are being developed, including those from BD? And any comments on the, uh, the question of, of uh, overall specificity and sensitivity for central lab tests vis-a-vis -vis point of care tests. Again, uh, here it's open forum for the panelists. So just jump in uh, on any of those questions. And if we have time, I'll, I'll put a few more on the table. Who would like to go first? So Gary, it's Dave. Let me, maybe let me try and just take the, I'll try and group the sense of security and the serology specificity sensitivity. So, so first of all, actually, just a few days ago, um, and there is a lot of dialogue around serology and the clinical performance. Um, and uh, for the first time, uh, there was actually guidance and an, um, uh, an umbrella policy released, at least from the FDA, and I think it'll sort of guide performance for the rest of the world around the expected level of performance for serology tests to be used. Uh, in clinical screening. So, you know, when when serology tests were first commercialized and, you know, there are literally hundreds of potential uh, tests available on the market or going through review, they weren't under any sort of relevant strict guidance and now they are being held to a higher level of clinical performance. So directionally, and this isn't the same for, for all assays, but, um, you know, you would expect a higher level of performance in lab-based tests versus point of care finger prick capillary tests, but even those point of care tests have to have a good level of performance. And I would say directionally, you're looking at greater than 95% combined sensitivity and specificity for the antibody tests, uh, number one. And, and we, as an industry, we're really glad to see that guidance issue. Um, and in terms of the false sense of security, um, I think, yeah, we, we have to be careful. I, I know when this sort of first started, you know, and even in Europe, countries like Germany were talking about immunity passports and things that, that people could use to go back to work. Honestly, and I, and I think to John's comments about this will be with us for a while, there's still so much we don't know. 
you know, when you start to look at potential mutation of the virus, uh, initially there was a hypothesis that would say if you had the virus, you would develop antibodies and natural immunity. Well, now people are potentially have got a potential uh, potential of secondary infection. Um, we're starting to see correlation between the disease severity uh, and the level of antibody and immunity build up. So. I think it's critical that we continue to do all the diagnostic tests we can, just so we can build a database to track the evolution of this. Um, and, and with that, I'll maybe pass over to another panelist. Hey, maybe uh, I think we're, we won't have time for more questions, but we certainly have time for another panelist to come in if you'd like to answer any of the questions that have already been uh, surfaced. Anyone else want to come? Okay, what I could answer is uh, and to piggyback a little bit on what Dave said. Look, this is early on. Public health practitioners are not fully aligned on these tests. This is much too soon. It's important to have lots of dialogue and bring people together so that eventually we can develop a consensus. But I'll go back to my analogy on the flu vaccination for regular flu. It's not perfect. We get part of it right, we get part of it wrong each year. But using the flu vaccine is very, very helpful and keeps society a much society much healthier than it would be if the flu vaccine were not used. It's the same thing for this testing. It will become much clearer over time, but there's no one answer for this whole testing area and COVID-19 today, just like in the HIV AIDS period, it took a while to get the science sorted out, but no one would have really said, don't use the early drugs because they are bad. They got better and the testing will get better. Stan, I think that's a very, very important point. And, and, and as long as therapeutics or diagnostics are safe, it may be that perfection becomes an impediment to progress and we have to be able to make progress. And also your point about which we are still early in this. and you know, there's an expression, you know, we're, we're sort of at the end of the beginning, and I don't think we're at the beginning of the end, but we are towards the end of the beginning. And uh, there's a lot that has to be learned, both with respect to testing and particularly with respect to treatments and vaccine development. So we're two minutes to close, and I'm going to, we may go one or two minutes over. I'll beg everyone's indulgence for that, because there's only two things left we'd like to do. One is turn to each panelist and just get a sentence or two. If there's one thing that you would want to see happen as a result of us working together to address diagnostics and COVID-19, what might that be? And Stan, if you don't mind, since you're on the camera, why don't we start with you? I would love to see programs that we had in vaccine, it's the CEPI program, different kinds of dialogue groups that, for example, the Gates Foundation brought together on vaccines. We need that kind of dialogue for testing and we need it urgently. And we cannot only think about the developed world, we need to think about the less developed parts of the world. Each one has different characteristics and different funding. Would love to see much more dialogue and many uh, public private partnerships unfold. Thank you, Stan. And since you mentioned Gates, Suman, let's go to you for final thought. Yeah, thank you, Stan. I think that's something the foundation has, has also been keen to uh, focus on, starting with the uh, CEO roundtable that I mentioned earlier. And in fact, the one that we have is a diagnostic specific leaders roundtable that brings together some of the, uh, these key com um, conversations as well. Um, but to your point, Gary, I think what we hope to see out of this COVID is you know, your earlier point of how do we make uh, lemonades out of lemon, that we really leverage this opportunity to make headway on some of the uh, um, long-term um, interventions that have been, you know, whether strengthening of the health systems or kind of uh, laying out the uh, framework and infrastructure for diagnostics for longer term uh, for other diseases as well in, in the global setting, like malaria, um, you know, TB and HIV, which are all um, areas of um, great commitment from the foundation as well. Thank you, Suman. Dave, final thoughts. Yeah, and I think for me, I'll just go back to the, for me, it's learning. Um, you know, when, when I look at what we've been able to accomplish as an industry um, in such a short fashion that that becomes the norm. So, you know, the industry and the agencies, honestly, that sort of guide and regulate everything that we do, we have just accomplished some amazing things together. You know, how do we take a step back from that? 
learn from this and, 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 and certainly for the right areas of focus, because this will happen again, you know it will at some point. How does this become the normal operating model for us? Thanks, Dave. And John, I'm going to turn to you for the final closing thoughts. Um, any Anything to share with us in terms of what you would most like to see happen as a result of the need to scale up diagnostics for this pandemic? John? Yeah, it, it's possible. Uh, I know how busy John is. It's possible he may have disconnected. Um, and if so, then I'm going to... Uh, bring the webinar to a close. I want to thank uh, PQMD for organizing the webinar. You really did fantastic work to, to, to put this together and also Midmark for setting up the platform that we use for this webinar. And everyone who's called in, hopefully you found this to be useful and insightful. I'll repeat again, I don't think you could have fi found four finer panelists to uh, guide us through this discussion. I'm going to just check once more, John, any chance you're still there? Okay, he's not. So uh, everyone, keep well, be healthy, keep yourself socially distanced. If you don't have to work in your workplace, work from home. It may get to you after a while, but it's the safest thing to do. And uh, use whatever capabilities you have to help address this pandemic, whether it's in your organization, your community, your state, your country, or as the, the panelists on this webinar are doing throughout the world. So thank you, Julie Marie. Any closing remarks from you? Well, I just wanted to really thank you again, everybody, for sharing your time with us today, panelists and attendees as like alike. Um, your insight is valuable today and every day in the work that you do. Gary, thank you for your vision and your commitment in bringing this webinar to life. Um, it really highlights the role of diagnostics in the global battle against COVID-19. Like Gary said, we are all in this together, and PQMD will continue to bring you webinars and host intriguing uh, discussions on our online format and our, our webinar series. So enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for the indulgence of a few minutes over. Take care everybody. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thanks Gary. Thanks. Panelists. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Everybody.